why pro tune a car? Um, especially when Cobb has lots of off the shelf maps. Uh, a good example is this car we're tuning right now. It has non Cobb hardware on it. So there isn't a Cobb map for that setup. Um, the car came in with a Cobb off the shelf map and had some fuel trims, uh, was under boosting because it has a, um, an aftermarket boost control solenoid that the map's not designed for. Um, and so the, consequently the car didn't make optimum power. Um, actually with some of those parts removed and a proper off the shelf map, the performance probably would have been quite a bit better. Uh, so what we were able to do is uh, take a look at what the car was doing, make some modifications to the map to uh, optimize the parts that are actually on the car in a safe manner. Tuning in general, regardless of whether you're using Cobb, standalone, um, HP tuners, whatever it is. Um, it's all generally the same thing. One of the big advantages with the Cobb is we can live tune the car. Uh, it makes it really quick to tune the car overall. If we're using uh, open source, for example, we have to make changes, down, flash the ECU, start it up, test it, and redo it again. Look at the data logs, and it's just a process. It takes time. So a lot of people want to use open source because it's inexpensive, but you pay for it in the tuning time. So there, maybe there's some cost savings overall, um, maybe not. It's probably a wash, but with Cobb, we can live tune the ECU for almost all the parameters that we care about. Um, air fuel, timing, boost, all that stuff is live tunable. So we can do it real time, we can do back-to-back -back dyno runs. The only thing really controlling how fast we tune it at that point is thermal management of the car on the dyno. Um, but regardless of what tuning platform we're using, with all the endurance racing experience we have, we tune things very safely because we know full well an aggressive tune uh, in your street car, it might be fine today and maybe it takes six months of life off of your car because it's too aggressive. And so we generally avoid doing that. And what we find out through racing is what is actually happening. We take a, you know, many years of use on the street and we compress that into a couple of weeks of racing and we get a lot of information back from that and we can extrapolate that out and apply that to the street cars that we tune. So just tuning strategy in general, like with the Subaru, what we do is we put in the dyno and just see where it's at. Um, does it have any fuel trims? Does it have any knock problems? Is it under boosting, over boosting? So we'll do a few pulls. Well, we'll actually just look at the data and just see what are the long-term fuel trims on the ECU to begin with? Is there anything we should be concerned about before we start dynoing it? Um, we can look at the tattletale and see if it has high or low boost. Um, in the case of this car, it was under boosting, so we were in a safe starting position. Um, so we were able to do some runs, monitor everything closely as we do the run, and verify it's safe. And from there, we were able to identify that, yeah, it's under boosting by five or six PSI because of the three port boost controller that the tune doesn't compensate for. Um, it has a different air intake than it's tuned for, so we have fuel trims. So the first thing we do is address the fuel issues. So the boost is on the safe side. Um, we go in, look at the fuel, do pulls, make sure that the, whatever air fuel we're, we are requesting is what we're actually getting. In the case of this car, it has factory wideband sensor. So we can data log that with high accuracy and we don't need to add in our own wideband. On a normal uh, EJ build uh, in like an STI, for example, we'd put our wideband in there and compare that against what the factory sensor reads and what we're commanding. Either way, we make sure whatever the ECU is asking for for air fuel ratio is what we're actually delivering. Once we accomplish that, we can start uh, dialing in the boost, get the boost up to where it's supposed to be, uh, and then we'll start feeding in or taking out ignition timing as needed by watching all of the feedback from each individual cylinder. We know exactly what's going on and we can tune it safely. And we build up from, we start with low power and we build up to where we want to be at. And some cars like this car, it appears to not have great fuel in it. So it was a challenge to get the power we wanted out of it in a safe manner. Um, we could turn off all the knock controls and just let it run all the timing. But then that car leaves and it blows up. So obviously we don't want to do that. So there's some limitations we have to work with, whether it's air temperature, intercooling on the specific car, fuel quality. There's all these things that come into play that we have to deal with to get an optimized tune. And sometimes it means you don't get all the power you might want, but it will mean you get a safe tune when you leave here. So here's a data log that we pulled off of the car in a dyno run. And we can see all this lower stuff on here. That is, noise from the knock sensors for each individual cylinder. 
the upper lines are the threshold in which the ECU considers it knock. Um, so it's pretty easy to see right here. Um, this is at about 6,000 RPMs. Um, we have a pretty high noise spike here, which definitely surpasses all of, doesn't, you don't even need to know what cylinder that's for to know it surpassed all of the thresholds and that created a knock event. So we're seeing quite a bit of that. So the first thing we do is we pull timing out of the table. And since we can do that live, it's a quick test. Um, we just go in, we go to our primary ignition map right here, and we go to the load and RPM. Uh, in that case, is about 6,000 RPMs, and it was in this load zone. We're already running pretty conservative timing here. Um, so we pull out a degree or two of timing in that entire area and repeat the process and see if it improves it or not. So here's an example of uh, a run that shows that, that same general region uh, for RPM and load that we don't have any knock events and we don't have any big spikes that are getting close in this area. So you can see that the timing changes are improving uh, the feedback knock and that it indeed is fixing the issue. The initial uh, boost map or uh, boost pressure from the base map that was on there and you can see where it basically it peaks at 13, maybe 14 pounds of boost, which is pretty low for these cars. Um, and that's just because of the wrong hardware being installed. Now we can also look at the duty cycle for the wastegate and we can see it's at 30% right here and it's basically maxing out in that range. So then the question is what's the requested boost versus uh, how much authority the wastegate has. So if we look at our boost targets here, um, they're in the 19 PSI range. So it wants to run more boost than it is. And the question is, why isn't it? If we go down and look at the current map, you can see that we have 50% as our upper authority for the wastegate in that zone and, as, and it tapers down as you go up in RPM. The base map was locked in at about 30%, so it wouldn't allow it to run any more boost. It was trying to, but it couldn't. Um, so this is an example of a change we would go in and make to get the boost to where it should be. So here's a graph of commanded air fuel versus actual air fuel. Um, so you can see they're pretty tight. They're within a tenth of a point. Um, there's a little bit of oscillation around the command. There always will be. Um, but the general trend is what we ask for is what we get. And that's where scaling the mass airflow sensor or whatever your primary load reference for the ECU is correctly makes a big difference. If you're asking for 11 to one air fuel, but you actually get 12 to one, so you have to ask for 10 to get the 11 that you want, that's an example of not tuning it correctly. So you need to make sure that whatever you're commanding is what you're getting uh, within reason. And so uh, these cars run a, a closed loop all the time. And so they do a good job of controlling that on their own. But what you'll see is they'll generate fuel trims. Um, and so if you have large fuel trims during wide open throttle, you have a problem and you need to address that. And so with this, we rescaled the mass airflow sensor to make sure there weren't any issues there. right here we picked up about 50 horsepower and about 50 foot-pounds of torque um, it's a little less than we would normally get on a um, vehicle like this with these modifications I strongly suspect it doesn't have the best fuel in there so we're running super conservative boost really conservative timing to keep everything safe still good gains a lot better than it was when it came in and we can revisit this with better quality fuel and see how it does with that